Well, good morning again, Life Words Church family and friends. We're so glad to have you with us this morning. We hope you enjoyed that time of praise and worship. And I'm just so excited to continue the second part of our series, I Want to Believe, But. And for a lot of us, if we're honest with ourselves, We've been at that place. We've been at that place where we just said, you know what, I, I want to believe or uh, I, I want to trust God more. I want to serve in his church. I want to give more. I want to connect with his church more. I want to do all these things for God. But and, for, and that but is followed by, you know, many different reasons why, you know, we were in that headspace. And maybe some of you are in that space right now. Or maybe we know someone who is in this, that space right now. So I want to encourage you that you just reach out to someone and just send them a message right now. Just say, hey, tune in to Life Words Church right now. Or maybe after this, this message, you just send them a text and send them a, a link to our, our recorded version of this message, which is available either on YouTube or in the Life Words Church mobile app. We want to make sure that people who are in this space, who are thinking the same thing that we're talking about, I want to believe, but I just don't feel God. I want to believe, but I've, I've experienced too much church hurt in the past. I want to believe, but... And so we want to be able to, to help them get through those type of feelings. And for those, maybe we know someone who is just at a point where it's, they're just simply flat out saying, I don't believe. We want to be able to show them that what they're believing and what they're rejecting is what we talked about last week is a distorted view of who God is. And so if there's anything that we should take away from last week's message, it's that people who say they don't believe people who say I want to believe, but it's not that they're rejecting who God truly is. They're rejecting a distorted view of him. And a lot of times the fault, the reason why they have that distorted view, it's because of us. Yeah, it's because of us, the, the, the stereotypical, what they call the, the church folk. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of work that we must do so that people don't have that distorted view, but actually see God for who he is. And I want to start off today by just sharing a little bit of my, my personal story. Um, I'm not the, your, your typical, I don't have that typical pastor story. Um, I wasn't raised, uh, or, or should I say, I wasn't groomed to be a pastor. I didn't preach my first sermon at five years old or anything like that. This was a decision. I, I, I didn't know I was on this path to be in a pastor till I was late into my ad ad adult year, adult years. And so I always knew that I wanted to follow Jesus, though. That, that's one thing for sure. I, I knew I wanted my, uh, to, to follow Jesus throughout my entire life, but I didn't want to be like some of the Christians that I saw. That, that, I, that I grew up seeing. I, I grew up seeing two conflicting views of Christianity and both created in me a distorted view of what of who God is. You know, on one side, I encountered Christianity that seemed to be, let's just say, it, it seemed to be very narrow minded. It was somewhat judgmental. It was even hypocritical at, at times. And and so to, to me, seeing that type of Christianity, it just seemed very boring and rigid because there were so many limitations and restrictions being placed. You had to dress a certain way. You had to go to church at certain times and maybe multiple times throughout the week. You couldn't go certain places. You couldn't eat certain things. It, it was just so many do's and, and don'ts that it just became just very boring and, and rigid. I even had friends who grew up in that type of a a atmosphere and they couldn't go to amusement parks with us. They couldn't go to the school dances because it seemed too worldly. They couldn't even go to the Friday night football game. So they missed out on so much enjoyment because they were in such a rigid type of Christian environment. And, and for the rest of us, we, we didn't want any part of that because we just wanted to have fun. We just wanted to have fun, hang out with friends and go to the parties, not do anything that was that would bring disappointment to God or our family. But we just wanted to enjoy life. And it just seemed like this type of Christianity, these type of, of, of religious religious people, we didn't want any part of that. And then on the other side 
of, of this distorted view that I had. It, 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 was, it came from the church that I grew up attending. And I, I guess the best way to say it, that my, my church was a, l- a little bit more, well, I shouldn't say a little, it was a lot more casual um, than, than, than some, some churches that were more rigid. I mean, and I'm not just talking about the dress code. I mean, there, there were times, and I'm not <laughs> going to call out any names because there could be some people watching from my home church when, when I was growing up. But, you know, there were times where as a kid, I, I viewed people who would go to church, maybe sing and, and, and maybe serve in the church. But then after church service was over in the parking lot, they're firing up a cigarette. And I'm just like, whoa. Whoa, (laughs) is this what we do? And so it it created a distorted view of who God was because this led me and my cousins to, to all of a sudden think that, hey, when we get older, when we get saved, this is the type of saved that we want to be. We want to be this type of saved because in this type of saved, we get to we get to drink, we get to cuss, we get to do whatever we want because this seems fun. And so I want to just appeal for a moment to the adults out there. We have to be very careful because we are our children's first example of what Christianity looks like. We are our children's first example or or, or basically giving them their first perception of who God is. So we very we have to be very mindful when we say that we're Christian. We have to give them the best example of who God is. Otherwise, they can grow up with these distorted views on Christianity, these these distorted views on who God is. And so in, in my case and in, in, or in either case, some of the people that I grew up with, they chose to reject Christianity. They chose to reject God. They weren't rejecting God. They weren't rejecting Jesus for who they truly were, but they were rejecting how people wrongly represented who Jesus was, wrongly represented who Christ, who God is. And so a lot for a lot of them, they grew up saying, you know what? I want to believe, but. I don't, I don't want to live this boring life. I don't want to live this rigid life that's full of a bunch of rules and restrictions. I don't want to live this life that would seem just so hypocritical to what God's word is. I want to believe, but it just seems like God is a, a killjoy. And that's the title of today's message. We're going to talk about that today. God as a killjoy. God, because a lot of people are like that. They they want to believe, but they don't want to serve a killjoy type of God, a God that doesn't want them to have fun, don't want them to live this abundant life that's supposedly written in his word. But we just don't see it in the natural because there are so many rules and restrictions and do's and don'ts. I want to believe in God, but there are just too many rules. There are too many restrictions. Some of us have been at that point. If, if we haven't been at that point, we probably Probably know someone who's who's at that point right now. So I want to share with you today some good news and some bad news. Which one do you want first? You want the good news first? Too late. I'm going to give you the bad news first this morning. But I want to share with you first the bad news about religion. The bad news about religion. And when I say religion today, I want you to understand I'm not talking about Christianity. I'm talking about the man-made rules and rituals that people invoke to try to please God. These things that we do in, in order and we tell people this is what pleases God. Going to church five days out of the week, having the having all these rituals, having, you know, praying for six hours on end, you know, dressing in, in, in this manner. All these things that we claim is, is what's pleasing to God isn't it, what, what it's all about. So I want to share with you today the bad news about religion and the bad news is this. And this is our first key point. Religion focuses on the external rather than the internal. I want you to get that. Religion, these man-made laws and rules and practices, focuses on the external more than it focuses on the internal. You know, we focus more on how somebody dresses before they walk into our church. We focus more on if someone is coming in, you know, maybe smelling like alcohol because they've been out on the street. We focus more on the fact that someone may not be married, but living with someone who they're connected with. We focus more on the external rather than what's on the inside, rather than focus on how's their heart. 
How's their soul? How's their faith level? And how can we help build their faith level? When challenges come their way, you know, are, are they running and hiding or are they, are they standing their ground, believing that God will, will make a way out of no way? We focus more on the external than the inter internal. Go with me now to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, we're going to read verse 25 and 26. It says this, it says, and this is Jesus talking. It says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. And it has an exclamation mark. So you can best believe that Jesus was probably yelling this. It says, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but the inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Verse 26, blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside also will be clean. <laughs> this is Jesus talking. He's like, look, you're, you, you, you're, you're making things on the outside look all shiny and pretty. You, you're wearing the, the beautiful, long, expensive robes. You're, you're shining up everything. But on the inside is what I'm concerned about. Because on the inside, there's uh, some greed, there's some lust, there's a lot of dirty things going on, on the inside. And once you clean up what's on the inside, Jesus says, the outside, it'll shine on its own. But you got to clean what's on the inside. And you know what? Ever since the fall of man and, and Genesis, there has been this gap between us and God. I mean, that's 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 a no, a, a no brainer. There's been this gap between us and God. But here's the thing. Religion attempts to close that gap with human effort, a human effort. I want you to get that. We basically say, if only I do this, if only I say this, if only I don't go to this place, if only I go here, if only I pray seven, eight, nine, ten hours a day, as long as I fast every every month, every month that has 31 days, if only I dress in this manner, I'm, do, I'm doing something that closes the gap between me and God. This is what the Pharisees tried to do. And Jesus basically said, look, don't be like them. They, 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 they don't get it. This is not what it's all about. Don't be like the Pharisees. They put on these big religious shows and they stand out on street corners praying these long and drawn out prayers. That's not what it's all about. Because Jesus said behind closed doors, here's, here's the things that they're doing. And we can look in scripture and see that behind closed doors, the Pharisees, they were ripping off, they were ripping off widows. Just stealing money from widows. They were enforcing a bunch of rules for people to follow, but they weren't follow, fo following the rules themselves. They were making rules like don't work on the Sabbath. Don't eat these type of foods. Don't hang out with sinners. They were making all of these rules, but not abiding by the rules themselves. I want to give you a little bit of history this morning. If we go back to the Old Testament, you know, right after Ezra and Nehemiah, the, re the religious leaders at that time, they were angry. They were angry that people were abusing God's laws. And so instead of going to the people and showing them how rich their lives would be if only they if honored God's laws, the 10 laws that he gave, uh, he gave to Moses, if we just abided by these laws, life would be a, a lot more simple. But because you chose to abuse God's laws, now we're living in bondage. Now we're suffering. Now we're struggling. So instead of them just teaching them to obey God's laws, what did the religious leaders, what did man do? They added 600 man-made laws to the, to the 10 laws that God gave to Moses. Can you imagine? Now, God created 10 laws, and then man came along and said, well, these are not working, so we need to add 600 plus more laws for people to follow. <laughs> and so these 600 plus laws, they were called the fence laws. The fence laws, because basically they, they were they were designed to place a hedge of protection around the 10 laws that God created, a hedge of protection around what we call the, the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. And so within within these fence laws that they were so extensive and drawn out that they created 65 laws alone about keeping the Sabbath. 
65. 65 laws alone to basically make sure that you, you don't do anything on the Sabbath day. <laughs> so th these are these were very extensive laws. So all these man-made laws, they were compiled into a book in the third century called the Misna. The Misna. And, and, and so once they compiled all these laws together, it became a book over 800 pages long. Can you imagine that this Misna book, 800 plus pages long, was was bigger than the Bible? <laughs> and so basically you, you probably be asking yourself now, well, how come I haven't have never heard of this Misna book, this book of laws? Well, it's because that n none of the laws within this book was inspired by God. You see, every word that, that is in the Bible was 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 either said by God or inspired by God. And so that's why it's holy. That's why we call it the Holy Scriptures. But this book of laws, <laughs> the reason you haven't heard of it, many of us haven't heard of it, is because God looks at that book and says, I didn't have anything to do with that. I gave my people a set of laws and, and, and these were the laws that they needed to follow. But those 600 plus laws that man created that I had no part of, I, I, I don't have any part of that. I, th there's no there's no need for all of that. If we just kept things simple and just follow God's laws, we wouldn't need a book of 800 plus pages of laws and 65 alone to just cover one one rule. And so all of these laws, they didn't even make it everything, anything better. But as we see, as we go through the, the, the Old Testament, it actually made things more complicated. It's almost like I can use the, anal uh, the analogy. It, it's like skydiving. If, if I'm now, let me preface this by saying that I have never <laughs> and don't have any intentions to ever go, go skydiving. But after talking with people who have gone skydiving and, you know, checking out a few YouTube videos, I know this for a fact that when you show up at the airport or the skydiving place, whatever, whatever it's called, when you show up there, uh, b before you even put on the jumpsuit or put on the parachute, you have to read a list of rules or what we can call laws. You have to read through those and then sign off saying that you have read through these laws, these rules, and you abide by them. And then you may even have to watch a safety video. And then you finally get to the point where you can put on the jumpsuit, you can put on the parachute. And at that point, your, your, your skydiving instructor is going to go through an entire long list of safety checkpoints, making sure that you're strapped in, making sure that your jumpsuit is on correctly. You have to go through a bunch of checkpoints and you haven't even boarded the airplane yet and then once you do get on the airplane once you do take off and you're in the air before you jump out of the airplane your instructor is going to go through another list of safety checks. He's going to tell you what to do once we jump. Here's what you need to do. Here's how you should hold your hands. Here's what you touch and here's what you don't touch and sometimes sometimes once in a while not very often, thank God, but every, sometimes it happens that the parachute doesn't open. And we all know what the end result is when the parachute doesn't open. And those times when the parachute doesn't open after, that, after such a horrible accident, what happens? is that they make more rules, more procedures, more laws for people to follow in order to try to prevent an, another accident, another horrific accident from happening. They create more checkpoints instead of just saying, you know what, maybe we shouldn't be jumping out of airplanes. Maybe that's what we should be doing because we weren't, we weren't never designed to fly. So maybe we just shouldn't be jumping out of airplanes. And so we treat our relationship with God the same way. We, we get so religious, we get ca so caught up on man-made laws that we forget that God created things to be simple. He created 10 laws for us to follow, but because of what we created, what we decided to do, what we decided to add on, what we decided to try to figure out how we can fly. Now we have all these laws and checkpoints that we must go through. And instead of just doing away with it all, 
We come and revamp it and add more and more and more. Go with me now to Matthew chapter 23. We're going to read verse 3 and 4. Matthew chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. This is Jesus talking again. Jesus said, don't follow the example of the Pharisees, for they don't practice what they teach. Verse 4, they crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Now look. This is Jesus basically saying, look, the example that the Pharisees have gave you, the rules and the the procedures and all the restrictions that they put in place, they're not even following. But they're pressuring you, they're, they're looking at you, they're judging you and making sure that you follow this because you must follow these rules and these laws in order to be right with God. And so if you ever said, if you ever said, I want to believe in God, but... There are too many rules. There are too many restrictions. There are too many do's and don'ts. Let me let you know right now that this is not a reflection of the heart of God. It is a reflection of what people have added in an attempt to make what's already perfect something that they can control. It's exactly what it is. We have to stop manipulating what the creator has already done. We have to be manipulating what's already good, what's already perfect, what's already beautiful. It's almost like when Coke decided to change their formula and create new Coke. We remember that if you were if you're my age or you remember in the 80s when they changed the formula and brought this new Coke, which was horrible. Because they decided that, hey, what we've created, what what has already been created, what is already successful, what is already good, let's put our hands on it to try to make it even better. And what happened? It made it worse. And and so we have to get to the point where we have to stop manipulating what God has already created. And so now that I share that, which I want to share with you now, the good news. We're going to end it today on the good news. And the good news is the good news about Jesus. I want to share with you three simple thoughts. And the first thought I want to share with you is this. You cannot earn God's acceptance by obeying the law. You cannot earn God's acceptance by obeying the law. Now, let me preface that by saying, look. Pastor Trey is not telling none of you to go out and break the law. That is not the law that I'm talking about. I'm talking about, we're talking about here, the rules and the restrictions, these religious laws that prevent us from doing things and living this abundant life that Jesus talked about. You cannot earn God's acceptance by simply obeying the law and nothing else. There's more to it than just obeying the law. Religion says that you please God by your works. But, you know, you you please God just by doing good and nothing bad. You go to church constantly. You be a good person. You get baptized by a a water immersion rather than having a sprinkle of water on your head. You you have to do it this way in order to be right with God. You have to read your Bible this amount of hours a day. That's what religion says. But I wanted to tell you what the word says. Can we go back to the word for a minute? Go with me now to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says this. It says, therefore, no one will be, no one, let's let's make sure we highlight that. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Let's, Let's just stop right there. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. That means you cannot just obey laws and think that you're righteous. It takes a lot more than just that to be righteous in God's sight. It takes more than just obeying the laws. It takes more than just uh, being obedient to man-made rules that 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 we've created within the church. It takes a faith also. It takes a belief. It takes the honor of God and who he is and knowing who God is in, in order to be righteous. The second simple thought I want to give you is the purpose of the law is to show you your need of a savior. The purpose of the law is to show you your need of a savior. Let's go back to to verse 20 for a minute and let's read it in its entirety. It says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, here we go, rather or instead, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Did you hear that? Through the law, we become conscious of our sin. 
It's through the law. It's through knowing what what God's laws are. And we look at that and compare our lives to what his law says that we realize, you know what? I need a savior because when I look at these commandments, when I look what what God says to do and don't do, it's more simple than what the world or or what the, the religious leaders have told me to do. It's much more simple. But when I look at this simple list, I look and see that. I've I've broken many of those laws and there's nothing that I can do. There's nothing that I can do to compensate what I did. So I need a savior. I need a savior because if, if I depended on me, I'm going to continue to break these laws. I am in need of a savior. And so it's so common for people to say today that, you know, I'm, I'm not a bad person. So, so I think I'm okay with God. You know, I, I, I do good. I give to the church. I go to the church from time to time, maybe Easter and Christmas. You know, I don't break any laws. I'm, I'm, I, I haven't you know, committed any crimes or anything like that. So I'm a good person. So how can you call me a sinner? But if we look at look back at the laws that God gave to Moses and, and compare those laws to our lives, we would see that we are sinners in need of a savior. Because if I ask you right now, have you lied before? Have you stolen anything before? Have you lusted before? Now, some of you, you, you may say yes to two out of those three. But if we are all honest, we would all say yes to th- all three of those. And so if, 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 if we've ever lied, if we ever stolen, if we ever lusted, that makes us a lying thief and an adulterer. According to God's word, that's what that makes it. So when we look at it in that way, we're basically in the same predicament Paul was in when he said, oh, what a wretched man am I? We're just as wretched as Paul was. So if Paul could recognize himself as a sinner, we must do the same thing. So until you're able to see yourself as a sinner, you won't see the need of us of having a savior. We must see the need of having a savior. And the third simple thought I want to give you today is being right with God comes by faith in Christ alone. Being right with God comes by faith in Christ alone. Let's continue uh, in in Romans chapter three. We're going to go down uh, two verses. We're going to go to verse 22. Verse 22 says this. It says this righteousness, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to who? All who believe. See, it doesn't say this righteousness is given. This righteousness through faith is given to those who go to church a certain amount of times each year. This righteousness is given to those who are who who, who are Pentecostal or this righteousness is given to those only who are Baptist. This righteousness is given to those who pray, you know, you know, at least six hours a day. This righteousness is only given to those who dress in a certain way. This righteousness itself says is given to all who just simply believe believe that's what it boils down to it's not about following certain religious laws and rules and restrictions jesus said he come to give us an abundant life and we must truly believe that an abundant life doesn't mean that we're just being showered down with blessings on blessings, but it also means that we can go out into the world and enjoy it. God has created so much in this world for us to take advantage of. So why not take advantage of the beauty that he created? Why not go to the beach and enjoy what he created? Why not see the beauty that's in the Grand Canyon? Why not take a vacation uh, to the other side of the world where God has created and, and Jesus even walked on certain certain lands why not enjoy life for what is truly intended to be abundant don't limit yourself life words family don't limit yourself by man-made rules and man-made laws just live according to what god has said righteousness does not come by doing more right than wrong your salvation wasn't even earned by anything that you did but it's because of what jesus did for you come on i need us to get that this morning There's nothing that we could have did to earn this this term righteousness. Our blessings 
Our blessings, they do not operate on a reward system or a point system like if, if we're at the grocery store, like at Safeway or something. We get these credit cards and we think that, you know, we're going to rack up all of these points in, in, in order to get a free Hawaiian vacation or something like that. And then we realize after swiping this credit card so many times and we go into one store and spend $200 but only earn two points. When the trip to, that free trip to Hawaii, we have to earn over 80,000 points. So imagine how much time, how much energy, how much money we wasted trying to earn something that's free, but technically is not free because we didn't spend tens of thousands of dollars going into debt to try to earn something. And we do the same thing with God. We, we're trying to earn points. We're trying to earn rewards by using so much energy following man-made laws and rules and restrictions when God said, I don't need you to do all that. It's very simple to earn the reward that I have for you. Just love me. Just love me. Just follow me. Just, just honor me. Just obey these 10 commandments. Just, just believe. Isn't it good to know that you don't need to earn points with God? Isn't it good to know that we don't have to follow a reward system with God? But all we have to do, Life Words family, is just believe. Just trust him. Just live according to his laws and not the laws that we try to add and manipulate on to his laws. So as I conclude today, Life Words family, I want to let you know, God is not a killjoy type of God. In a nutshell, that's it. God is not a killjoy type of God. Trust me, as much as I like to have fun, as much as I like to laugh, as much as I like to joke, if God was a killjoy type of God, I wouldn't be where I am right now. But God gives us a joy and a faith that kills sin. He's not a killjoy God, but he gives us a joy and a faith that kills our sin. You want more proof of it? I want to give you just one more piece of evidence that God is not this killjoy type of God. Many of us recall, I know it's not Easter, but we're going to go back to the cross. When Jesus hung on the cross, we know that while he was on that cross, there were two men, one on his left, one on his right. And so one of the men, as they hung on the cross, he basically shouted out to Jesus saying, look, if you're truly the Messiah, if you're the one who saved so many people, you healed so many people, you delivered so many people. If you're that guy, why won't you save yourself? If you're truly who you say you are, save yourself and bring yourself down up off this cross. And then the, the other person who was being hung on the other side of Jesus, paying for the crimes that he committed, he shouted out to Jesus as well, but he said something different. He basically just told him, remember me when you stand before your father in heaven. Remember me. And Jesus responded to him. And Jesus told him from this day on this day, you will you will be with me in paradise. You will be with me in heaven from this day forward. So wait a minute, Pastor Trey, what are you saying? This man who just asked Jesus to remember him, he didn't need to, you know, make make anything to, to compensate, do anything to compensate for the crimes that he committed. He probably was a murderer. He could have been a rapist. He could, could have done some horrible crimes. You mean he didn't have to pay the punishment? You mean he didn't have to pay for his crimes? No, because Jesus was paying for it himself. Because he was an innocent man up on the cross. Jesus was paying for, you mean to, to say, Pastor Trey, that he didn't need to go and get baptized. He didn't need to go to church. He didn't need to get his life right. Because come on, a lot of us say that. I, I, I want to be a part of the church. I want to serve. I want to give. I, I want to take a role on, on the dream team. I want to serve. Uh, I want to be a part of a life group. I want to do all these things for God. But first, I got to get my life right. Come on, a lot of us think that. We have to get our life right before we can get right with God. But I want to let you know that, no, this man didn't have to do none of that. All he had to do was believe. That's all he had to do was believe. You see, re religion has complicated what God has made so, so very simple. 
And so what is the good news today, Life Words family? The good news is, if, if I can summarize it all in, in three steps, we sinned, Christ died, and God forgave. We sinned, Christ died, and God forgave. It is just that simple. We cannot earn this salvation. We cannot earn, you know, anything. We don't, we didn't deserve salvation. We, we didn't deserve, you know, the access to righteousness. We didn't deserve any of it, but it's not about us being perfect. It's all about Jesus and us having a perfecting faith. Notice I didn't say a perfect faith because we're going to fall short. We're going to slip up. But we're going to be pressing toward, like what Paul talked about, we're going to be pressing toward a mark. We're going to keep pushing forward. Even though we may fall 10 times, we're still going to get up 11 times to keep on going. We're going to keep on pursuing God. We're going to keep on loving him. We're going to keep on trying our best to honor him. And we're going to keep on loving others as well. That's what a perfecting faith is all about. You see, religion complicates with laws, but Jesus simplifies with love. That's just it. Religion will complicate things with their laws, but Jesus simplifies it all with love. So what about that woman who who is caught in adultery? Should, shouldn't we, you know, shouldn't we judge her? Shouldn't we talk about her? Shouldn't, shouldn't she have to compensate? Because look, she just ruined her family. She definitely just ruined her marriage, but she probably just broke her family up entirely. So what are we supposed to do about her? Same thing Jesus did. We love her. We love her. We, it's just that simple. Well, Pastor Trey, what about that man who committed robbery or probably committed assault or even murder? I mean, it's, he committed such a horrible crime. Shouldn't he have to pay for that? What do we do about him? What do we do? Shouldn't we point a finger? Shouldn't we stay away from people like that? Because he's a danger. He's a, he's a menace to society. Shouldn't we stay away? What do we do about him? The same thing Jesus did. We love him. We love him. Well, Pastor Trey, what about those people? You know, we always, you know, talk about those people. What about those people who, who are, you know, smoking and drinking and doing drugs? What do we do about them? Because they just, are, they, they just are, seem so far from God. They seem so far from Jesus. What do we do about them? That we do the same thing that Jesus did. We love them. Because when while the religious leaders were were kept in their cliques, while the religious leaders were creating so many laws for people to, to follow, while religious leaders were saying, don't hang around sinners. What was Jesus doing? He hung around sinners. He loved on sinners and those sinners became his disciples. Those sinners became the ones who created the church that we're a part of now. So if Jesus can love the sinner, we love the sinner as well. And if we love the sinner, that means we're loving ourselves as well because we're sinners. Life Word Church is not complicated. I know, I know we've made it very complicated. I know we've made things so complicated that some people just can't see their way to Jesus, just can't see themselves closing the gap between themselves and God, but it's not that complicated. What is the most important commandment to love God and to love your neighbors as yourself? It's all about love. God is love. Jesus is love. And if we start with love, we can we, we can close that gap between ourselves and God. We can close the gap between us and others. We can close the gap between the church and the rest of society if we start with love. You know, it's, it's, it's said it so, so clearly in John 3.16. Many of us, this was the first scripture that we ever learned. John 3.16, where it says, For God so loved the world. It didn't say that for God so loved just the, the, the religious leaders. For God so loved just the Jews. For God so loved just the Pentecostals. For God so loved just people who wore uh, certain robes or, or had certain titles. No, no, no. It says for God so loved the entire world. The world. The world, the people that the religious people talk about. The people that we call worldly people. For God Love them that he gave his 
only begotten son. And all we have to do, it says whoever. It doesn't say that you have to have a certain VIP access. It doesn't say that you have to have a certain number of rewards points. You have to earn the, the credits in order to have this everlasting life that he talks about. It just says whoever believes. Whoever believes shall have eternal life. Why? Because Jesus, he paid the price for every sin that you committed. Every sin that you committed in the past, every sin that you might have committed last night, and every sin that you're going to commit in the future. He paid for that, for you to have this opportunity for eternal life. And so I want to take a moment now to invite you, invite you to having eternal life. And it starts by having a relationship with Jesus himself. It starts by saying yes to Jesus and making him the head of your life. By saying, Jesus, I give my life to you. I want to be under your will. I want to be under God's will. I surrender my life. I surrender doing things the way I want to do them. I surrender all the, these man-made rules and restrictions and I just give it all to you in order to just love you and believe in you. I want to do things your father's way. I want to do things because as a Christian, as someone who gives their life to Christ, we're heirs to the throne of heaven. So our father in heaven wants to give us the keys to the kingdom just as he's given it to Jesus. And so it all starts by just saying yes to Jesus today. And so we want to invite you now to say yes to Jesus. We want to invite you now to a relationship with him. We want to invite you now to what's called salvation. Salvation, just a, a renewal, a renewal of life. It can start today for you. And it's very easy to do. We, we keep things very simple just the way that Jesus did. We want things to be very simple for you. So, so from right from where you are, you can say yes to Jesus. It doesn't have to be a bunch of rules and restrictions. It doesn't have to be a bunch of checkpoints. All you have to do is say yes. Just say yes to Jesus. And you can do so from right where you are. You can put something in the comments right now. Or you can send us a text. You should see the number showing up at the bottom of the screen. Let us know that you made a decision to give your life to Christ today. And we want to celebrate that. We want to honor that. We want to walk this Christian journey out with you and just do life with you so that you know that you don't have to do this thing alone. You don't have to follow a bunch of rules and, and restrictions. You don't have to prevent yourself from living life at its fullest. But we want to be able to live life at its fullest with you and, and just just welcome you into this circle, this family of friends. And maybe you've already given your life to Jesus, but you may be wanting a family of friends that you can connect with, that you can do life with. You know, we're at a point right now where, you know, COVID restrictions are, are lifted and we can meet face to face a lot more often. We can begin planning for worshiping together face to face again and we cannot wait for that so we want to invite you now to a family of friends that's going to welcome you going to connect with you going to grow with you we're going to do life together you know that's why life groups are so important here at life words church it goes beyond just us seeing each other on on, on sundays for for an hour and a half but we also want to be able to connect with you throughout the week. If you're going through something, we want to know that you, we want you to know that there's someone that's ready and willing to pray for you. We want you to know that there are life groups available for you to just connect with other members and just enjoy doing life together. Because the things that you like to do, no matter what it is, I can assure you that there is someone within Life Words Church that enjoys doing that as well. So why not do it together? Why not enjoy doing life together? So that's what we're all about here at Life Words Church. And we want to invite you now to be a part of Life Words Church. You can say you can say yes, or you can just say that you want to be a part of Life Words by just putting something in the comments right now or send us sending us a text. Either way works. But we want to celebrate you for making that decision to be a part of Life Words. But we also are going to reach out to you, give you some practical next steps on your journey. Now, when we say next steps, that doesn't mean that there's a lot of rules and restrictions here at Life Word Church? Absolutely not. But we do want to welcome you and, and invite you to join us for our growth track. Because in our growth track, there are four simple things that we're going to do and four simple things that you're going to learn. 
You're going to know God in a more intimate way. Then you're going to find freedom. Those things that have held you back in the past, those thoughts that have held you back in the past, those actions, those rules and restrictions that held you back in the past, you're going to find freedom from those things. And then we're also going to show you how God has distinctively wired you. And so you're going to understand who you are and discover your purpose. And then lastly, we're going to release you into the church and into your community to make a difference by serving, by serving here at Life Word Church and serving in your community to make a difference in the lives of others. That's what our growth track is all about. It's just that simple. Yes, it is. So at this time, maybe you're in need of prayer and, and we want to know if, if there's a specific prayer request that you have. We want to be able to pray with you. And so what you can do is go to our website, just go to lifewordschurch.com slash prayer and you can submit your personal prayer request so that we know how to specifically pray for you. But for right now, I just want to pray for all of us. So if you would just give me a few seconds just to pray for us all. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning, oh God. That in spite of things that we created, either ourselves or other religious people have created that has widened the gap between us and you. Father, you are constantly trying to build a bridge between, between us. You are constantly chasing after us. So Father, we choose today to chase after you, to close the gap between us, oh God. And we just choose on this day to believe. We may have said in the past, I want to believe in you, but... Certain things happen. Certain situations in my life have restricted me or, or just made it, made it seem like it was too difficult or I was too far from you. But Father, today we choose to believe. And so for that person, oh God, who chooses to do nothing but believe in you today and trust you, Father, we ask right now that you speak life into them. Father, we ask right now that you just just give them hope, give them a new, a refound hope in you, a newfound hope in you, O oh God. Father, redefine their future, O oh God. We thank you right now, God, for the breakthrough that is happening in their lives because of you, because of your love for them, O oh God, because of the sacrifice that your son paid for them. So we just love you today. We honor you. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Amen. So we're about to wrap up for today. But before we do, we want to finish by with our final form of worship, which is giving. We just want, I want to take this moment just really fast just to thank all of you, the LifeWords family and some LifeWords friends who have really just made the commitment to give to LifeWords Church. Some of you are tithing. You, you've told us you're tithing for the first time and it may feel a little scary and you may not really understand it, but you're, you're believing. You're believing. I believe that God is going to honor your commitment to him and to his church. So we want to thank you so much for your giving. It's only because of your giving that we're in the position that we're in getting ready to move into our own facility, getting ready to relaunch the church. While many other ministries have closed their doors for good, we're reopen. No, <laughs> we're opening new doors. Hallelujah. That is so awesome to know that. And it's only because, well, for one, because of the grace of God, but also because of your commitment. Because of your financial commitment to Life Words Church, we are in this position. So thank you so much. And I just want to encourage you right now. Uh, maybe you, 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 maybe your giving has been sporadic, or maybe you haven't been giving at all. I want to challenge you now to make the commitment, because every single dollar that you give to Life Word Church, it goes directly into the future growth of this ministry. It goes directly into making an impact on someone's life, either here locally or someone around the world. Your giving helps us grow God's church. And so if, if you're if you're not been practicing giving or or it's just been sporadic, I want to challenge you now to make the commitment. Make the commitment today to, to, to start tithing. It's just 10 percent. If God has blessed you with one hundred dollars, he's basically saying, just give ten dollars to my church. It's just that simple. Just like we talked about today. It is just that simple. And so you can give very easily today on our website. Just go to Life Words Church dot com slash give and you can give any dollar amount right there on our website it takes less than two minutes 
to do so very fast and easy, safe and secure to do so. Or as you may see on the screen right now, we have some other ways that you can give. You can even text to give from right now or on your cell phone. You can text any whole dollar, just text that amount to, the, to 84321 and instantly you're giving to Life Words Church. This is very, very simple to do. Um, once, you, once you send uh, that text, it'll respond by just giving you step-by-step -step instructions. It takes less than a minute to give to Life Words Church via text. Or maybe if you're old school and you just want to just send a, write out a check and, and, and send your tithes and offering uh, via the mail, as you can see on the screen is our current address. We'll be updating that very soon to our new address, uh, so we're, we're excited about that. But no matter how you give, we just want to say thank you. We honor you for your giving, and God honors your, your cheerful heart as well. But at this time, we are done for the day. I want to thank you all so very much for joining us today and worshiping with us. We cannot wait to connect with you very soon. Don't forget to join our launch team. Go now to our website, lifewordschurch.com slash launch. Join the launch team today. Our first meeting is coming up very, very soon. So we don't want you to miss out on the fun. And trust me, if I have anything to do with it, we are going to have some fun. And we want you a part of that. But other than that, we will see you next week. Have a blessed rest of your Sunday. Have a blessed week. And we'll see you right back here next week for another worship experience here at Life Church. God bless you.